The Nigerian Civil War, also known as the Biafran War, the 6th of July 1967 to 15 January 1970, was a war fought to counter the secession of Biafra from Nigeria. Biafra represented nationalist aspirations of the Igbo people, whose leadership felt they could no longer coexist with the northern-dominated federal government. The conflict resulted from political, economic, ethnic, cultural and religious tensions which preceded Britain's formal decolonization of Nigeria from 1960 to 1963. Immediate causes of the war in 1966 included a military coup, a counter-coup, and persecution of Igbo living in northern Nigeria. Control over oil production in the Niger Delta played a vital strategic role. Within a year, the federal military government surrounded Biafra, capturing coastal oil facilities and the city of Port Harcourt. The blockade imposed during the ensuing stalemate led to severe famine, accomplished deliberately as a war strategy. Over the two and a half years of the war, about two million civilians died from starvation and diseases. This famine entered world awareness in mid-1968, when images of malnourished and starving children suddenly saturated the mass media of Western countries. The plight of the starving Biafrans became a cause célèbre in foreign countries, enabling a significant rise in the funding and prominence of international non-governmental organizations. Britain and the Soviet Union were the main backers of the federal military government in Lagos, while France and some independent elements supported Biafra. France and Israel provided weapons to both combatants. Background Ethnic division Like most other African countries, British Nigeria grouped people together for governance without respect for their religious, linguistic, and ethnic differences. Nigeria, which gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1960, had at that time a population of 60 million people consisting of nearly 300 differing ethnic and cultural groups. More than 50 years earlier, the United Kingdom had carved an area out of West Africa containing hundreds of different ethnic groups and unified it, calling it Nigeria. Although the area contained many different groups, the three predominant groups were the Igbo, which formed between 60 to 70 percent of the population in the southeast, the Hausa Fulani, which formed about 65 percent of the peoples in the northern part of the territory, and the Yoruba, which formed about 75 percent of the population in the southwestern part. Although these groups have their own homelands, by the 1960s they were dispersed across Nigeria, with all three ethnic groups represented substantially in major cities. When the war broke out in 1967 there were still 5,000 Igbos in Lagos. The semi-feudal and Islamic House of Fulani in the north were traditionally ruled by a feudal, conservative Islamic hierarchy consisting of emirs who, in turn, owed their allegiance to a supreme sultan. This sultan was regarded as the source of all political power and religious authority. The Yoruba political system in the southwest, like that of the House of Fulani, also consisted of a series of monarchs, the Oba. The Yoruba monarchs, however, were less autocratic than those in the north, and the political and social system of the Yoruba accordingly allowed for greater upward mobility based on acquired rather than inherited wealth and title. The Igbo in the southeast, in contrast to the two other groups, lived mostly in autonomous, democratically organized communities. Although there were monarchs in many of these ancient cities such as the Kingdom of NRI, in its zenith the kingdom controlled most of Igbo land, including influence on the Anioma people, Erachukwu, and on its Ha land. Unlike the other two regions, decisions among the Igbo were made by general assembly in which men could participate. The differing political systems among these three peoples reflected and produced divergent customs and values. The Hausa Fulani commoners, having contact with the political system only through a village head designated by the emir or one of his subordinates, did not view political leaders as amenable to influence. 
political decisions were to be submitted to, as with other highly authoritarian religious and political systems. Leadership positions were taken by persons willing to be subservient and loyal to superiors. A chief function of this political system was to maintain Islamic and conservative values, which caused many House of Fulani to view economic and social innovation as subversive or sacrilegious. In contrast to the House of Fulani, the Igbo often participated directly in the decisions which affected their lives. They had a lively awareness of the political system and regarded it as an instrument for achieving their own personal goals. Status was acquired through the ability to arbitrate disputes that might arise in the village and through acquiring rather than inheriting wealth. Igbos were substantially victimized in the Atlantic slave trade. In the year 1790 it was reported that of 20,000 people sold each year from Bonnie. 16,000 were Igbo. With their emphasis upon social achievement and political participation, the Igbo adapted to and challenged colonial rule in innovative ways. These tradition-derived differences were perpetuated and perhaps even enhanced by the British system of colonial rule in Nigeria. In the north, the British found it convenient to rule indirectly through the emirs thus perpetuating rather than changing the indigenous authoritarian political system. As a concomitant of this system, Christian missionaries were excluded from the north, and the area thus remained virtually closed to European cultural imperialism. In contrast to the Igbo, the richest of whom sent many of their sons to British universities, during the ensuing years, the northern emirs thus were able to maintain traditional political and religious institutions, while reinforcing their social structure. In this division, the north, at the time of independence in 1960, was by far the most underdeveloped area in Nigeria, with an English literacy rate of 2% as compared to 19.2% in the east, learned in connection with religious education, was much higher. The west enjoyed a much higher literacy level, being the first part of the country to have contact with western education in addition to the free primary education program of the pre-independence Western regional government. In the South, the missionaries rapidly introduced Western forms of education. Consequently, the Yoruba were the first group in Nigeria to adopt Western bureaucratic social norms and they provided the first African civil servants, doctors, lawyers, and other technicians and professionals. In Igbo areas, Missionaries were introduced at a later date because of British difficulty in establishing firm control over the highly autonomous Igbo communities. However, the Igbo people took to Western education actively, and they overwhelmingly came to adopt Christianity. Population pressure in the Igbo homeland combined with aspirations for monetary wages drove thousands of Igbo to other parts of Nigeria in search of work. By the 1960s, Igbo political culture was more unified and the region relatively prosperous, with tradesmen and literate elites active not just in the traditionally Igbo South but throughout Nigeria. Therefore, by 1966, the ethnic and religious differences between Northerners and Igbos had combined with additional stratification of education and class. Politics and economics of federalism The British colonial ideology that divided Nigeria into three regions, north, west and east, exacerbated the already well-developed economic, political, and social differences among Nigeria's different ethnic groups. The country was divided in such a way that the north had a slightly higher population than the other two regions combined. On this basis the northern region was allocated a majority of the seats in the federal legislature established by the colonial authorities. Within each of the three regions the dominant ethnic groups, the Hausa Fulani, Yoruba, and Igbo, respectively formed political parties that were largely regional and based on ethnic allegiances. The Northern People's Congress in the North, the Action Group in the West, and the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons in the East, 
These parties were not exclusively homogeneous in terms of their ethnic or regional makeup. The disintegration of Nigeria resulted largely from the fact that these parties were primarily based in one region and one tribe. To simplify matters, we will refer to them here as the Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo based, or Northern, Western, and Eastern parties. The basis of modern Nigeria formed in 1914, when Britain amalgamated the northern and southern protectorates. Beginning with the northern protectorate, the British implemented a system of indirect rule according to which they exerted influence through alliances with local forces. This system worked so well, colonial governor Frederick Lugard successfully lobbied to extend it to the southern protectorate through amalgamation. In this way, a foreign and hierarchical system of governance was imposed on the Igbos intellectuals began to agitate for greater rights and independence. The size of this intellectual class increased significantly in the 1950s, with the massive expansion of the national education program. During the 1940s and 1950s the Igbo and Yoruba parties were in the forefront of the fight for independence from Britain. They also wanted an independent Nigeria to be organized into several small states so that the conservative north could not dominate the country. Northern leaders, fearful that independence would mean political and economic domination by the more westernized elites in the south preferred the perpetuation of British rule, as a condition for accepting independence. They demanded that the country continue to be divided into three regions with the North having a clear majority. Igbo and Yoruba leaders, anxious to obtain an independent country at all costs, accepted the Northern demands. However, it would be wrong to state that the two southern regions were politically or philosophically aligned and there were already discordants between the two southern political parties. Firstly, the AG favored a loose confederacy of regions in the emergent Nigerian nation whereby each region would be in total control of its own distinct territory. The status of Lagos was a sore point for the AG which did not want Lagos a Yoruba town which was at that time the federal capital and seat of national government to be designated as the capital of Nigeria if it meant loss of Yoruba suzerainty. The AG insisted that Lagos, a Yoruba city which was situated in western Nigeria must be completely recognized as a Yoruba town without any loss of identity, control or autonomy by the Yoruba. Contrary to this position, the NCNC was anxious to declare Lagos, by virtue of it being the federal capital territory, as no man's land, a declaration which as could be expected angered the AG which offered to help fund the development of other territory in Nigeria as federal capital territory, and then threatened succession from Nigeria if it didn't get its way. The threat of succession by the AG was tabled, documented and recorded in numerous constitutional conferences, including the Constitutional Conference held in London in 1954 with the demand that a right of succession be enshrined in the constitution of the emerging Nigerian nation to allow any part of the emergent nation to opt out of Nigeria, should the need arise. Tekena N. Tamano Source the Journal of Modern African Studies, Volume 8, No. 4, pp. 563-584 This proposal for inclusion of right of succession by the regions in independent Nigeria by the AG was rejected and resisted by NCNC which vehemently argued for a tightly bound united, unitary structured nation because it viewed the provision of a succession clause as detrimental to the formation of a unitary Nigerian state. In the face of sustained opposition by the NCNC delegates, later joined by the NPC and backed by threats to view maintenance of the inclusion of succession by the AG as treasonable by the British, the AG was forced to renounce its position of inclusion of the right of succession a part of the Nigerian constitution. 
It should be noted that, had such a provision been made in the Nigerian constitution, later events which led to the Nigerian Biafran civil war would have been avoided. The pre-independence alliance between the NCNC and the NPC against the aspirations of the AG would later set the tone for political governance of independent Nigeria by the NCNC, NPC and lead to disaster in later years in Nigeria. Northern Southern Tension manifested on 1 May 1953, as fighting in the northern city of Kano. The political parties tended to focus on building power in their own regions, resulting in an incoherent and disunified dynamic in the federal government. In 1946, the British divided the southern region into the western region and the eastern region. Each government was entitled to collect royalties from resources extracted within its area. This changed in 1956 when Shell BP found large petroleum deposits in the eastern region. A commission led by Jeremy Raisman and Ronald Tress determined that resource royalties would now enter distributable pools account with the money split between different parts of government. To ensure continuing influence, the British promoted unity in the northern bloc and discord among and within the two southern regions, as well as the creation of a new Midwestern region in an area with oil potential. The new constitution of 1946 also proclaimed that the entire property and in control of all mineral oils in, under, or upon any lands in Nigeria, and of all rivers, streams, and water courses throughout Nigeria is and shall be vested in the crown. Britain profited significantly from a five-fold rise in Nigerian exports amidst the post-war economic boom.